So yeah, I, it was kind of funny, I, about uh, six weeks ago, and I, I always wonder why I agreed to do these things, but I, I had a, agreed to speak at Organic Alberta's conference on soil testing, you know, kind of the benefits of soil testing and all the different uh, types of tests that we can do. And of course, there's, there's all the conventional tests that, you know, we're more used to doing, you know, in terms of, you know, looking at chemical al analysis. But I was also talking about some of the new biological tests and some of those, uh, you know, indicator tests that we can do. But uh, in my bio, I, I was thinking, you know, should I really tell them that I used to work for Monsanto, you know, that I started my career doing research with glyphosate? And I didn't do that, actually, and it was a good thing because uh, they had a real hate on for glyphosate that, that day because, of course, the organic production that's trying to go into Europe, they're finding trace levels like the rest of us in, in our glyphosate. But it was, uh, it was one of those things where I was kind of slinking around, you know, not wanting, hoping that people didn't recognize me as a, a former uh, rep and researcher with Monsanto. But, yeah, so... To tell you a little bit today about some some work that uh, the it's really the uh, uh, Palliser Agricultural Management uh, Society which I when I graduated from government back in 2014 some of the guys in that group said you know hey you know why don't you come and you know do some consulting work with us if 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 you're planning to do some something after uh, retirement or graduation as I kind of often referred to it, but so that group I had kind of helped get started, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that, that group in a minute, because they, this is really their project, and so we, we did this work in, uh, in 2014 to 2016, and we, I think that because they self-funded it, you know, I was, there was a confidentiality agreement in terms of sharing the results, we wanted, they wanted to know this information for their farms, and they, they also, though, recognized that, you know, it would be important to kind of release the information, but to do, to do so when Agriculture Canada released the information from their trial, which was, um, which, you know, we really, we really kind of built our project off of, off of their trial. So let me just make sure I get this uh, right here for advancing the slides. Yeah. So, yeah, what we'll cover today here is talk a little bit about who that PAMS group is. Can everybody hear me? Are we we're clear there? Uh, the bit of background on why, why we did this trial or why PAMS wanted to do this trial and talk about what we learned and then maybe recommendations and we can kind of have some discussion on that. Um, yeah, so who are who are PAMS? So this is a group of guys that I got to know pretty well in the early days of uh, direct seeding when I came to Southern Alberta in, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, these guys were a lot younger as I was and they were the first guys kind of on, we'll call it the bleeding edge of, of uh, continuous cropping and then direct seeding and then uh, no-till. They decided about 15 years ago and I helped them as a government guy, helped them to get a peer group started, and they formed a society, you know, as part of that. And uh, basically, this this these guys meet, you know, during the winter, you know, kind of on a monthly basis. They share information, and they they do a summer tour. So here we're out on a tour with Bob Blackshaw, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Greg Bauer is kind of hiding in the background there, you know, he's the uh, he's the local guy with the Pams group and. This group actually has now, there's a, there's a younger bunch. Um, some of the son's nephews started their own group, and so I work with this group and the other group. And it's just a small portion of, of my time, but it's, uh, these guys keep me on my toes. So, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So when you think of, uh, you know, glyphosate as such a critical, critical component to farming, and, you know, I... Again, I started my career in research with Monsanto in Lethbridge and doing work in forestry and orchards and, of course, in southern Alberta in some of the early years. Went on into as a sales rep with Monsanto and then eventually over into extension and um, circled back into southern Alberta 
in the late 80s. And by then, you know, glyphosate was coming down in price to the point where, you know, I mean, when I, when I left Monsanto, it was about $24.99 a liter for the old original. <laughs> and so we always knew that this product would be used you know, on mass, if if the price ever came down, and of course, as you know, as it approached, um, you know, as we as we all know, you know, it's just such an integral product for what we do out there. I guess during you know, in the late '90s and through the year, early 2000s, I think obviously, you know, questions started to come come up in terms of okay, is glyphosate as benign as us sales reps and as we in research assumed it to be back in the early days. And so this is really, if you ever want to kind of look at uh, this article in the No-Till Farmer by Matt Hagney is a good one. And, and it kind of got us thinking in, the, in, in 2010, he did a pretty good review on you know, glyphosate from the point of view of a no-till farmer. Is it as benign as we you know, thought it was in terms of not from a human health perspective, that's a whole different question. I think it's relatively safe and non-toxic from the human health. But what are the issues in terms of soil? So we, we, you know, kind of been tracing back a little bit over this last 10 years to say, okay, what are potentially some of the issues? Just one uh, study that was published here in December of 2019, uh, this is work out of Finland, and glyphosate residues in the soil affect crop plant germination and growth. Is that th there's obviously some situations where we're going to see this, we'll talk about um, what we observed in our trial and what was in, you know, kind of observed in the Ag Canada research that's been done lately. But again, it's in the spotlight. I know uh, working on an international peer group with some producers from from Finland, and, and of course glyphosate is banned, you know, in Finland and a lot of Scandinavia right now, very, very challenging for them to find those tools that they need to do the things that we do. And this is a really good article. And it's from the Western producer in, you know, just a month ago on the science of glyphosate. And again, if time, we'll come back and talk about this. But it summarizes the results from some recent USDA work uh, looking at glyphosate imp impacts on the soil microbiome. And this is a really good news scenario from those of us that are wondering about because of the potential effects on on uh, organisms that would be more maybe more sensitive to glyphosate, and uh, really good news. We also looked at that in our trial, and so uh, again we'll we'll touch on that here, if uh, time permits. So, the uh, back in 2014, I initially learned about this study that uh, Bob Blackshaw started. And it had started in, in 2013. We learned about it in the winter of 2014. And I say we because I, I was at a meeting with the PAMS group. And there was kind of two components to Bob's study. One was a greenhouse study, and that's been published, and we'll touch on that again, uh, some of the results from that. There he looked at what kind of glyphosate soil residue levels are required to impact on crop productivity, because of course, you know, we're hearing in the news, people are saying, well, you know, glyphosate is, my crop's not growing, is it glyphosate? What's, what's happening here? And so he did that work. <clears throat> that was a greenhouse study, you know, where they used soils from Lacombe and Lethbridge and used soils that were very sandy soils because sandier soils, you know, would tend to, tend to be a little bit more uh, of an issue than maybe some of our more uh, clay-based soils. At the same time, he had this field study, which was looking at glyphosate buildup and crop producti productivity impacts at five sites. And those sites are shown here. Uh, Beaver Lodge in northwest Alberta, kind of a, kind of a clay soil and gray wooded soil. You can see the site at Lethbridge, Scott, Swift Current, and Brandon. So this was uh, 20 site years, so four years of data that that Bob accumulated, and um, we we learned about this, and so the PAMS guys, I said, well, well, this is good, you know, you know, we, we kind of in meeting with Bob, we said this is good because it's going to help us to decide whether there really is in fact an, an issue, and, and we'll kind of be 
describing that that project. But this is we're we're back to our our day in the field here with Bob and 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 Bob is you know kind of explaining uh, you know the work that's that's happening and some of the results that they're seeing. Of course, the the Pam's guys being uh, of this feeling that you know, but Bob, our soils are different from what you have on the research center. I mean. We appreciate that this work is happening, and we have confidence in the research that's doing, that's happening. But uh, you know, the, the Pam's guys are saying, you know, our soils are a little bit different because we've been at this for a long time. And really, I think the the message, really, I think, if we translated that, though, it's probably that our systems are different, right? Our systems are different. And if you look at, like most of the work that's happening at our research centers, and and really, quite frankly, most of our direct direct seeding or what we would consider no-till in Western Canada would be with hoe type systems and so most of our research is going to look something like that. Whereas when you look at the PAMS guys, these are all guys that are, again, they were on the bleeding edge so they're kind of longer term no-till, 25 plus years with ultra low disturbance seeding systems so they're using the discs. And just a couple of examples here, I mean just a, a pee on strip stubble really high residue cover and that buildup of kind of that organic duff layer at the soil surface. So you see this accumulate over time. Uh, you see almost a kind of a partitioning of organic matter where we've got, you know, quite a bit of organic carbon right at the soil surface. Great soil biology. I mean, this isn't untypical of what we see, you know, in those fields where, you know, you, you dig down and you think, wow, you know, why didn't we think of this sooner? in terms of the benefits. So they said, yeah, okay. <clears throat> we'd, like to, we'd like to see this done on our farms, but okay, Ag Canada is not in a position to do that, so how about we do it? So they kind of talked to me. I was just in the process of taking a bunch of vacation, you know, leading up to my retirement with, from Alberta Ag. They said, Rob, can you put together an idea here in terms of how we can do this maybe at... at Initially, one site we ended up with uh, with three sites, where we took that basic design from Ag Canada, their four-year glyphosate study, and then uh, we we put that out on three sites that had over 20 years of low disturbance no-till with heavy cover, and that's a replicated uh, complete block block design type trial uh, for reps and the farmer was planting across that. So we weren't attempting, we didn't have the ability to uh, to go in and seed these plots ourselves. So the, the, farm, the farmer was just planting across, and this was with the, a John Deere disc system. So we didn't, uh, we didn't really have a lot of options there in terms of comparing different openers and that kind of thing in this. But here's the, here, here's the catch on, on what this Ag Canada study was, was glyphosate applied on the same plot area both pre-seed and post-harvest over three-year period. So that, that, that plot gets, you know, gets, uh, gets the same rate of glyphosate and at very high rates. So we, we had the, you know, a zero check obviously in there, but there was, a, there was one, two, four, and eight. So that one kilogram per hectare rate would be the equivalent of about one liter of the old 360 formulation, right? So we're talking about kind of almost somewhat realistic or, or you know, rates that we would be using out in the countryside. But then it, you know, in, in, uh, in the Ag Canada study and in ours, we're looking at, okay, are we gonna see effects when we double that, quadruple it and go eightfold, what would kind of be typically used as a you know, as rates, and then we're looking, of course, at the accumulation of that. And then for a check, we had Liberty plus Select. We we added something that wasn't in the Ag Canada trial, and we said, let's go with two checks. Let's have that Liberty check, but we also had a hand weeded check. And that was a lot of, a lot of work for an old guy, but we, we did that. And so we basically had no glyphosate herbicide on that uh, one, one of those plots, so that was kind of interesting, and then did the uh, did the stats on that. This is part of a sorry. This is part of a presentation I gave to the weed science community in Kelowna, and so there's a little bit 
I'm going to skip over some of the stats type work here today for this presentation, but part of the reason we wanted to present this now that Ag Canada is publishing their work, we wanted to uh, release this information. So again, these are really high uh, residue covered fields. Uh, we went in and we characterized that residue and you know, separated into the different fractions because we, you know, part of the thing is, you know, how much, you know, cover do we have on these fields? And so we weighed that and did the carbon analysis on that. And I'll just point to that trial site information. So we had a site at Lethbridge in a dark brown, Clarisome uh, in a dark brown, and then foremost in, in a brown soil, soil zone. So that was on the Hilder, Hildebrandt farm. So you can kind of see the texture. Uh, have a look at that surface residue. I mean, and wow, we've had some pretty good years, but when you, even with the presence of earthworms, you know, we're, we're feeding some livestock out there, but gosh, there's a, there's a real accumulation of, and that's dry matter, you know, uh, kilograms per hectare of dry matter that's accumulated on the surface. And, you know, again, no surprise there for those of you that are in those systems. The other thing I'll just point out is, again, that organic matter, if you look at the profile of the organic matter in that top five centimeters, we would always, in most of our soils, expect to see more organic carbon in that top two inches. And so you can kind of see that uh, that profile there. And, you know, we'll come back to that in terms of some of, you know, so I told the guys, I said, gosh, you want to pay me to do this research, you know, and so it's all self-funded on their part, which is fine, but... This is, you know, I, I don't think we're going to learn anything that we haven't known over the years about glyphosate. So then you go out uh, in that first spring and, oh my goodness, what have we got here? So here we are on um, the Lethbridge site, that first spring uh, flax on pea stubble. And we've got what looks like some injury or some germination issues happening on a flax crop. And I'm going to move through this fairly quickly to give you a picture in terms of what we observed in this trial, suffice to say that uh, that would be the plant counts at that site. And that uh, that one kilogram rate, again, on the left there, would be kind of not an untypical rate. That would be about 0.67 of, uh, you know, of, a, of, a, of one of the newer formulations of the Weathermax liters, or, you know, about, about one liter of, of the old original. So those aren't unreasonable rates, and we're seeing a pretty significant hit compared to the Liberty check or the no burn off check over on the, the right hand side. I won't show you a lot of the data. Uh, we're kind of in the process of considering getting the data published with some help from Charles Geddes. But having said that, you can kind of see uh, the statistical data here. The and this is the only slide like this I'll show you, so uh, uh, don't rush out the door here. But it is, you know, really just showing that decline in plant density on the left, but not always a decline in yield. So the uh, the solid color versus the gray lines, or the black versus the gray, are where we had significant, you know, statistical significance. And so you can kind of see the the line running there for. Uh, the Lethbridge site, for example, and that's uh, we had we had an effect on flax, we had an effect on hemp, but in the final year we didn't have an effect on 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 Durham wheat. At other sites we did have an effect on cereals, but and then you look at the yield on the other side. What we learned is that we could reduce the uh, hemp population by about forty percent and increase the yield by fifty percent, so <laughs> or forty percent. So, I mean, and that's part of the thing. You know, we were looking at. We were doing plant counts. We were looking at uh, disease. We did not see any differences in terms of uh, uh, root-borne or or disease. Uh, the Ag Canada site looked at things like micronutrients, and they did the tissue testing all along the way. Uh, we did not do that, but we just looked principally at plant counts and yield. Well, you can see. So this was concerning to the farmers, and they said, "Okay, well we're." We're glad we're looking at this because I could, I could tell you that Ag Canada in the 20 site years that they did never saw any impact in terms of productivity as measured by plant density or as measured by yield. So no effect on the uh, 
20 sight years across the prairies. We were seeing it consistently at the three no-till sites in southern Alberta. So here's a, just another example at Foremost. This is peas. Uh, they check in the background. And normally I would have gone out there as an agronomist and said, oh man, we got some, you know, we got some trash issues, we've got some hairpinning, we've got some maybe potentially disease issues. But when we look at the check, you know, the crop's doing pretty good where we had glyphosate. Again, showing the ridiculously high rate here because of the, um, it's a more dramatic difference, but seeing some height difference on those uh, plants that did emerge. P density, again, uh, no stats on this particular site, but this was, you know, again, very significant in terms of uh, stand reduction. Not necessarily in terms of yield. Uh, we saw it on winter wheat, seeded on that pea stubble. Again, uh, just looking at the data, fall and and uh, fall counts and spring counts, and so you can kind of see the trend there that we're, we're picking up that injury at what would I would consider to be a very, very safe rate from my background in terms of understanding glyphosate. Certainly gets worse when you get higher rates. And um, even seeing some from the Liberty Select, seeing a little bit of an effect. Not significant though. So up to Clarisome, um, our third site here, you know, on flax. Again, the same trend and I'll move through this fairly quickly here. But yeah, you can see you know, see that effect and flax is kind of, you know, turns out to be our indicator crop here in terms of its susceptibility. Um, but we were seeing this on wheat, we were seeing it on winter wheat, we were seeing it on hemp, we were seeing it on pea, but not always, right? So we started, this got us thinking, so we said, what is the possible mechanism here? So is this glyphosate that's in that duff layer, is it getting hung up in that duff layer and the roots of the plant are, you know, taking up some glyphosate and we're getting some of this effect, but gosh, you know, the this crop isn't even coming out of the ground. You know, where we're seeing these reduced germ rates, the crop isn't really even making it out of the ground. So we said, well, is it, does it have to do with, you know, our disc planting system in through that heavy residue? Is that part of the issue? So we kind of, and of course we were looking and seeing, ah, here's the spot where we sampled for residue and the flax looks a little better. Now, is that a temperature effect or is it, are we safening this by, you know, with, with, the, with the residue? So uh, we, we, we designed a trial for 2015 and 2016 where we said, well, let's, let's pull some of that residue off, you know, before we do the pre-seed burn off and see if we can safen that. This is what that kind of looked like, you know, where we had cover versus where we didn't. And you can see there's still, that duff layer is still there. And so what we found in that, in that first year of doing that is that Liberty check on the left and then, so it, it wasn't completely safening it. It was helping a little bit, but, it, you know, this is challenging research and, of course, PAMs are opening their wallets to pay for this. So it's, it's, it's a little bit tricky to to say, you know, how many years are we going to have to go to figure out, you know, what the mechanism is here? Is it soil? Is it residue? Is it, you know, what's, what's, what's causing this? So if we, in, in 2016, so we, we, we pressed a little further and we said, okay, that's what our, that's what we can do when we kind of pull off that surface residue, that, that new residue, but we've still got a bunch of this litter. So we actually went in and we, we took the lawnmower out, we vacuumed off, you know, that, that duff layer. So he said, okay, let's, let's try that. And that, that actually did make a difference. And I'll just show you this one site. So this is that clarosome here. This was not great research because we, partly because I wasn't, you know, we, we weren't prepared to go out and, and, and strip the residue off of a, you know, half, you know, 10 acres. But we, we basically, you know, we went, we went in here with, uh, with some replication and this was kind of the result. So you look at that zero glyphosate, you know, on the left or that would be the Liberty, uh, the Liberty Select compared to two, four and eight, just to, to get an indication, does it, does it safen it when we pull off that residue? And you can kind of see that orange bar there that 
in fact, we, we, we think that probably part of what is happening, at least here, is that as that, as that seedling is coming through, and some seedlings may be a little bit more sensitive than others, is, that, is it picking up a bit of glyphosate as it's emerging through that duff layer, through that, through that residue? We can't say for sure, based on the work that we've done, but we've kind of, again, presenting this to the science community to say, yeah, it'd be nice to know. Because there's a lot of people that think there's benefits to the low disturbance disc type systems from a moisture, from a soil point of view. Let's find out, you know, about this. So, so again, Bob, Bob's study, uh, thanks to Charles Geddes, who's taken that program over there, is being, is being released. Uh, there is a, uh, you know, I, I guess to, to kind of sum up, and I'll just, uh, that last sentence in there, uh, the, you know, that, that it's, you know, from the, from the, they didn't see any issues in terms of crop productivity. And, you know, Charles, I think, has even presented that information to Farming Smarter at the different conferences. No, but there was, there was, uh, there was greater, you know, like you can see the difference in terms of the glyphosate concentration, but there was no impact on crop productivity. And that's kind of the thing that was concerning us. We did look at the amount of glyphosate remaining in the soil at the end of the trial. So that 8 kg, so on the bottom axis there where it says 8, that particular plot would have got 40 kilograms of glyphosate over the three years. Like we were pouring it on because we put this on pre-plant in the spring post-harvest, pre-plant in the spring post-harvest, pre-plant. So we, we poured on, you know, a lot. <clears throat> so it, and the equivalent at that, you know, one milligram per kilogram would be the equivalent of about, you know, somewhere around uh, two kilograms left by the time we sampled that, you know, six weeks after that last application in the spring of 2016. So that to me is kind of a good news scenario in a way in that it's saying that, yeah, the soil is doing what it should and the microbes are, are breaking this stuff down. And that's a whole different story, but Bob did the work uh, in the greenhouse that we talked about, that work has been published. Uh, and overall, again, quoting from this overall result, indicate that even with frequent high-dose glyphosate applications over several years, the likelihood of a, of a, of a crop injury for the crops that we would grow is, is relatively low. I mean, you had to be putting on 80 liters or 100 liters to get the concentrations in the soil that would be impacting those crops at about a 20% level. And we weren't anywhere near that. So those effects on soil biology, and I, I know I'm not wanting to run over time here, but uh, the effects on soil biology, overall conclusion of Bob's study, we did the soil biology testing on our sites as well. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of data and Charles and the scientists at Lethbridge are still sorting through this data, but there appeared to be no effects at the 1x rate. And the rates at the high, at, you know, at higher rates are very inconsistent. And general, generally what you find, you know, as more studies are happening across the northern Great Plains, and this is work out of the Pacific Northwest here, is that there are certain things that happen when you're using glyphosate in terms of its effect on microbes related to the green bridge. You know, and the green bridge would be, we've got some weeds out there, downy brome, spring cereals, wild oats. We spray those as they are, uh, as those plants are decomposing. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of like an inoculation on the crop coming through with pathogens and that kind of thing. So that's the green bridge effect. But really, that's, you know, they would say that that would con considered to be not a big issue and more work out of the states. Basically, they're saying that, you know, there was uh, really very little microbial impact. And what what is happening, you know, here is that, and we've had some speakers come in and talk about that at our conferences down here, right? Is that, you know, we have this ability now to look into that through DNA analysis into that black box, which was the soil. And we can really get a much better picture in terms of what's happening when we use when we apply different management practices. 
So in summary then, uh, we did see glyphosate reduce plant density and at times yield for several crop types in, in the study that we did. Uh, by removing most of that litter prior to treatment, it reduced but didn't eliminate the effect. So again, we, we don't know the mechanism. Um, the soil concentrations of glyphosate and AMPA, which is the, it's the metabolite that is next in line as glyphosate breaks down, it also has some herbicide activity. So we always track that one as well. They were within the range of what we would, would expect from other studies and what would have been predicted based on the old work that was done. And of course, it's always like that, isn't it? More research is needed um, to say, why are we seeing those effects? And are there risks to other you know, crop types? Anecdotally, the farmers that I'm working with have now gone in and we've done some testing to, to, to see this on a field scale. Crops like alfalfa, we have to be really careful. Could, could tell you that one. And I think, why is the difference there with our, is, it, is there a difference because it's long-term no-till or is it a difference because of that planting system? You know, our hole openers that, you know, would kind of, you know, move some of that material off. So, wisdom from Dwayne Beck, and uh, I think I'm over time, but you can kind of read that one. But Dwayne always told us, you know, about those unintended consequences. And so, and really the message here is that, um, you know, diverse crop rotations play a part in ensuring that the chemistries aren't abused. We've kind of, we, we have to be cautious with glyphosate. The guys that, in the PAMS group, they know that they're, they're not getting much over, you know, kind of, you know, 0.5 kg on their applications. They're, they're looking at other actives, they're looking at other ways to manage their weeds and, and not depending on that from, based on what we, what they've seen. I want to say special thanks, and part of the reason I wanted to present this here today is, uh, well, of course, Albert Agriculture, who are friends with Albert Agriculture, pretty much probably done by the by this time next month. But uh, you know, obviously, I couldn't have done this without that help, and for Farming Smarter as well, you know, helping with uh, you know harvesting or or combining some of the hand samples, and then uh, Blackshaw and and Charles Geddes for for support. So. And I've managed to take all my time, I think. So, thank you. <laughs>